Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm your guest host, Emmy Vadness, filling in for Jeffrey Mishla. Our topic today is love and impermanence. My guest is Matthew McKay, who's been a clinical psychologist for 40 years and is a professor of psychology at the Wright Institute. He has authored and co-authored more than 40 books, including The Relaxation and Stress Reduction Workbook, Seeking Jordan, How I Learned About Death, and The Invisible Universe, The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife, Jordan's Message to the Living on What to Expect After Death, and Love in the Time of Impermanence, which is the topic of our conversation today. Matthew lives in Berkeley, California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Matt. It's such a joy to have you with us on New Thinking Aloud today. My pleasure, Emmy. You began talking to your 23-year-old son after he was tragically murdered. Yeah, uh, that was uh, something that uh, happened 14 years ago. Uh, It was an enormous, enormous moment in my life. And as when you lose anyone uh, whom you love, you want to know if that soul still exists and are they okay, are they happy? And so I set uh, about uh, finding him and finding a way to communicate with him. And over a number of months, I explored all kinds of experiences to try to reach him. Eventually, the late Ralph Metzner, who was a specialist in after-death communication, taught me how to channel. And when I learned how to channel, uh, suddenly this opportunity open to actually be able to talk to him, to have conversations, and to learn and be guided by him. What did you learn from Jordan during that channeling that helped you with your grief? Well, I learned, first of all, that he's with me, that the love between us continues to exist. In fact, I learned that the love between all souls, who living and dead, continues without interruption, that that death has no dominion over love, Uh, and that he continues to watch over me, he continues to care for me, he's in a good place. He went on to describe uh, the afterlife, and uh, we did, in in fact, uh, turn that into a book, uh, The the Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife, where he uh, he's, he's helping people with their fear of death and helping them prepare for what is on the other side in the spirit world. So that, so he, he taught me a lot and he showed me a lot. Um, and he decided also that <clears throat> we could have a project together, uh, helping people learn how to love in the face of pain. How, how do you love in this world of impermanence where there's so much loss, so much struggle? Um, we, we live in a, in a, a, a an ongoing school of impermanence here on earth and, and how how do, how do you love in the face of all of that all of the change that we endure in our lives all the pain that we face so he wanted to, to help people learn how to do that what did he share with you about what his experience is in the afterlife well he described the, the process of of entering the spirit world you know that we arrive at a landing place where we're we have to get used to not having a nervous system uh, ex- uh not walking with our legs but, but moving with, by intention of being able to see and experience in 360 degrees uh, i mean there's so many things that change uh, when when we are not encumbered by a body and so we, you know, arrive at a landing place where we have to get used to that. And, and it's a place that's prepared for us to help calm us and, and give us uh, support during the transition. But it's also a place where, um, whatever we think in our mind, we can hallucinate and actually we can see whatever images show up in our mind. They, they turn into energetic shapes and forms. 
And, um, and so, you know, we can, we can imagine some very scary stuff. And if you ar- arrive at the landing place and, um, you have a lot of fear, uh, you can, you can create images that really frighten you further. So there's a, there's a whole process of getting used to not having a body. Uh, and eventually, uh, we matriculate into the spirit world proper and go through an, a lot of important stages, including the life review, uh, joining our, our soul group, uh, re, you know, beginning again or the, the lessons that we learn and the, and the training and, that we are getting in, in the, in the spirit world, we all are working toward, uh, what you might call spiritual careers. Uh, some are healers, some are, uh, guides, uh, some are actually scientists. So they're, you know, beginning to think about and develop new worlds. So, um, <clears throat> you know, so there's this, it's a beautiful place and it's all held together with love the relationship between every soul is one of love and and communications are through the medium of love so it's a he's described a place that gave me this deep sense of contentment that he was happy and also he described a place that i could then you know through his words uh, offer a sense of the afterlife to other people beautiful i'm so glad you're able to connect with your Son, how long into that channeling experience and connecting with him did you find that that helped you with your sense of loss of him being here on the physical earth plane? The the sense of the loss started changing immediately. As soon as I started to be able to hear from him and we began to have conversations, uh, and and actually, I had this experience that basically any time I wanted to talk to him, I could. Uh, it was a profound experience. In, in some ways, he's he's more accessible to me uh, in spirit than he was living in a physical body on Earth. Um, and it's, it's certainly not that I don't miss him. I, I miss being able to hug and hold and see him and watch him grow and develop and, and live his life. Um, but... But I can talk to him anytime I want, uh, and I can have his support and guidance anytime I want. Uh, and, and this is something I guess, you know, I might just mention that, um, uh, Ralph Messner taught me about uh, communicating with souls in the afterlife is, is that they're just a thought away. You can open the channel when you think about them. Uh, and as, and, and as soon as you do think about them, they are aware of you. They are, they are instantly aware and a channel does open. You can use it or not use it. Uh, you can deliberately enter that, that space and begin asking questions and getting answers. Um, and it, it's, it feels very much like prayer, um, uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, we could, we can send messages and we can also be receptive and get messages back. And that's really essentially what channeling is. Um, it's, it's telepathic communication aimed at loved ones that we know on the other side and, and being receptive for the communication in return. So yes, it, it's a very powerful, beautiful thing. Uh, I, you know, I would give anything to have Jordan still here in this life, but on the other hand, I have something very, very precious. I have his guidance, his love, his support, and these projects that he has offered and, uh, that we engage in where we're attempting to provide important information to the living uh, from someone who knows a lot, who who's had many lives and has access to all the wisdom uh, in the afterlife. You mentioned that Ralph Metzner assisted you with channeling. Can you share maybe a few suggestions on how one might be able to communicate with a past loved one? I think the most important thing to realize is that channeling does not require any special powers. You don't have to be clairaudient. You, it does, I have no special powers at all. Um, and yet, uh, I've taught hundreds of people to channel and they almost universally are able to do it. Uh, it's a very simple process in some ways. It, it, it starts with, you know, get something that, that, uh, a physical object that connects you to that loved one. It could be 
you know, something that they own or something belonged to them or something they gave to you, but something that connects you. Um, have something for eye fixation. Candles work great. Uh, just, just something that you, you go through the ceremony of, of lighting the candle, bringing that object, uh, connecting you to the loved one into this, into the space. Uh, and then a simple Vipassana meditation, just a, a, a meditation on the breath, just focusing on the breath, uh, noticing the breath. I usually count my out breaths, uh, up to 10. Uh, I might do that several rounds of, of 10 breaths, just focusing on the breath when thoughts occur. Bring your attention back to the breath. Um, and so that, that quiets the mind and begins to create a re- receptivity. And then, um, you can, uh, Ralph taught me that you, you can visualize a, an orb, the color of sun just above your, just above your head. And then imagine that and visualize that orb elongating. Uh, into a long uh, sun-colored t- tube that connects you to your loved one. And um, and that is really a very simple process. And then, and then you begin the, the uh, conversation by writing down your question. I think it's important, particularly in the beginning, to write everything down. Uh, write the question down and, and, and observe your, your pen as you, as you literally... Uh, form the words on the page and then just wait and, and let whatever shows up in your mind show up. The first word, write that down and then the next word and the next word. Sometimes it comes in very hesitant, uh, little, uh, sh- small bursts and, um, and you write it down. Don't try to think about it. Don't evaluate it. Don't judge it. Just write whatever shows up. And, um, and after a while, uh, it, the channel opens more easily. The ch- channel becomes, uh, it, it becomes easier to hear, uh, th- through telepathically through the channel. So it's really a very simple process. Um, and it is something that virtually anyone can do. And, and again, direct, direct your questions to that particular loved one. You have to have, be, be clear about your spiritual address where, where you're sending the questions and then write the answers down. And the thing that's nice about that is that you now have a record of, of the communication, of the conversation, the questions and the answers that you got from your loved one. And um, I often go back and read things that Jordan has uh, told me that I wrote down, you know, even years ago and get comfort and new knowledge from reading those things over. So it's helpful to have those uh, a record of those conversations. For those listening who might be wondering, well, maybe this is just you're making it up in your own imagination. What might you say to those folks? What happens when you're doing channeling is that you begin to actually notice that the communication style, uh, the verbal style, uh, is really not your own. Uh, The messages I get really are Jordan's way of talking. And, and also Jordan has lots of things to say that has never, ever occurred to me that are not part of my knowledge base. And, and suddenly he'll launch into something and I'm, I'm like, you know, what is that? You know, and I, it's nothing that has ever, ever occurred to me. It's not a thought that I've ever had in my life. Um, and so the uniqueness of the, of the language and the, and the style of communicating some of the things that the loved one may tell you, but also there's a feeling of veracity. There's a feeling like, you know, for example, when you ask for advice or support, the things that you hear back, um, give you that feeling of being loved, of being supported, of being guided. And that feeling is very powerful. And it feels like it comes from something outside yourself. So I just encourage people to try it and notice what the experience is like for them. What is a message that Jordan shared with you that really sticks out to you about how we can know that love continues even when we have experienced a loss, whether it's a loved one or it could be a loss of a place, it could be a loss of a relationship or really any loss? Love continues because we decide for it to continue. Um, 
And, uh, and love is really the thing that Jordan says over and over again is that love isn't a feeling. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, the need or desire for someone, uh, or the, or, 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 or an emotion. Um, love is action. Love is doing. And so the action that we take to maintain and enact, to, to turn our love into action for someone who's on the other side is, is, is our attention, is bringing our attention to that person. Um, being aware of the existence of that, of that, of that soul on the other side and, com- and actively communicating and engaging in, in a connecting process to that soul. So, so l- love is always action. And in this case, f- between, uh, incarnate and discarnate souls, um, that action involves telepathic communication and, and, and actively sending love. I send Jordan love all the time. I, 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 you know, send him my awareness of him and my love for him. And I, and he sends it back. So it's, it, it, again, love is a very active process, whether we're talking about just love between humans, uh, or love, uh, between incarnates and discarnates. Yeah. Very active. You say in your book that love is the energy form that connects the universe. That's what Jordan tells me that love, uh, and and gravity actually the the force of gravity uh it are are really the same thing and 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 love is is essentially relationship it's attention it's paying attention it's seeing and so uh how the universe is held together is that the mind of all sees everything connects everything uh through attention and and love and attention and seeing are really the same thing. And, and, and the gravitational forces that hold all of us together uh, on a spiritual level is love. Since there's so much change that we have in our lives, how can we transcend that sense of impermanence? Well, first of all, what we have to be aware of what is permanent, what, what is enduring. Uh, and that what's permanent is our souls. Our souls will continue uh, long after our bodies are uh, finished in this world. Uh, so that's, so our consciousness and the love that connects us is eternal. That will, that will never ever change. But on earth, we do, we are in this school of impermanence because things keep being taken from us. Things keep changing, shifting, uh, uh, altering form, uh, dissolving. And in our relationships, we often end up, uh, apparently losing the relationship, uh, through rejection or, or disinterest or, or people move away, uh, or their needs change and so forth. And so relationships are undergoing constant change and, 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 and the physical person who's in the relationship is undergoing constant change physically. Uh, and so we are, eternally different i mean my wife and i have been together for 40 years uh but you know our bodies have changed our health has changed um our abilities change um and so in the face of all of that and 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 our needs have changed everything is is constantly in flux and in the face of all that how do you hold on to love and that's what jordan really wants to teach people is how they can keep love in the face of this eternally changing environment we live in. So how do we do that? Jordan says that there are basically four elements to love and, and each of them have to be actively, we have to be actively engaged with each of these elements. And the first element is caring really, you know, whatever we love, we have, we have to care about it. It's well being has to matter to us. It has to, It'd be important to us how, how the beloved, uh, is and feels, uh, and, and that is an active process. Caring is an active process. The second piece of love is knowing, seeing. If you don't really know this, this thing that you love, uh, how can you love what you don't know, uh, what you don't see? And, uh, and so seeing is an active process and, and what that means between 
humans is actually paying a lot of attention to the experience of that other person. Uh, you know, learning about them constantly. We constantly can discover, uh, things about that other. You know, what are their needs? What, uh, what are their fears? Um, you know, what are their, uh, preferences, their aversions? Um, what kind of emotional pain are they experiencing? How do they see the world? Um, what are their challenges? In other words, we're really loving that person is an active process of discovering them, seeing and knowing what's going on with them. Uh, cause if we don't know them, we just project. And this is often what happens when we fall in love early in a relationship where we fall in love. We're projecting. We're making the person up. Um, so we're actually projecting ourselves and our ideals onto that person. And so that really isn't love. Uh, it, de- love depends on seeing and knowing that person as they are and continually actively discovering them. Um, and that can mean things as simple as asking questions. You know, how are you today? How did you feel? What happened to you? Um, how do you, how do you understand some event that happened? How do you, how do you make sense of that? Um, so again, there's this constant discovery that goes on with love. The third element is compassion. Um, and compassion is seeing what hurts. It's seeing the pain that the other experiences. If you, if you can't see the pain, you can't, you can't really have compassion. If you can't see how that other struggles and suffers and, and, and the changes and difficulties and challenges that other faces, then, uh, compassion is not possible. So it's paying attention to the pain. And, and it, the second thing is actively wanting to support or help the other with that pain. Okay. So that's, that's the third piece. And the fourth piece is intention. It's the intention to love, to, to, to turn love into action, uh, to make it something that is not just, you know, an emotion or a feeling or an idea but something that actually occurs in the world, that is actual behavior. Uh, and so we have a, a a little meditation that helps people start their day. It's, it's, it's called the, the morning intention meditation. It helps people start their day um, with um, the commitment to bring, bringing love into all the important moments during that day and into, into basically the moments of choice that occur during that day. And we could do that meditation if you'd like. It's, a, uh, it's fairly short, and it's something that I encourage people to start their day with. Now, before we do the meditation, just to be clear what a moment of choice is. A moment of choice usually occurs in when you are with someone. You're, you're involved in some sort of interpersonal moment. Uh, and a moment of choice can be a moment when you have high emotion. It could be a moment when you have strong desire. It could be a moment when you're in pain. So those three elements tend to, tend to be a signal that this is a moment of choice. Strong emotion, pain, um, and, and some sort of desire. Uh, and so what we're, when we're talking about moment of choice, we're talking about moments where that shows up. Desire, pain, emotion shows up and, and could be influencing our behavior. And, um, and so in this moment of choice meditation, we're, we're going to have the intention at those moments to be love at the, at the moment of choice. I am love is, is how the meditation goes. So if, if you want to start, we can, uh, it's very simple. Uh, our, our viewers can cl- close their eyes for a moment and just pay attention to your breath, bring your attention down to your diaphragm, the center of breath, the center of life. And notice your breath with your in-breath, say to yourself, in. With your out-breath, say out. Just noting the breath in and out. In and out. And as thoughts arise as they do, just gently noting the thought and bringing your attention back to your breath. 
always bringing your attention back to your breath. In and out. As thoughts arise, gently bring your attention back to your breath. Just noticing each breath in and out. And now you can say to yourself, Today, at the moment of choice, I am love. Just bring your full intention today at the moment of choice. I am love. Let that be your intention for today. And you can start every day with that intention. Today, at the moment of choice, I am love. And when you're ready, take one more breath and bring your attention back to the screen and join all of us again. So that's how we bring love into everyday life and into action. How love becomes more than just a feeling or a wish or an attitude, but it becomes what we do, how we live. And it enters all the important choices that we face during the day. Every moment of choice, we intend to act with love. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you for guiding us in that, Matt. It makes me think of Ram Das. I am loving awareness, I believe, is one of his mantras. And I believe he has a book, Be Love Now. For those who, many of us, throughout moments of our day where we can just start feeling apathetic or, <laughs> you know, want to say, screw it. <laughs> what suggestions do you have to help us come back to I am love? I choose love. Actually, one of the biggest obstacles to love is judgment. And it's, and it's really probably what's most responsible for um, interrupting the loving connection between humans. Uh, and also interrupting the love of self. Um, it's judgment. It's having these good, bad ideas about ourselves and others. And, and so if you feel like love is, you know, slipping away or, or your, your, your attention is, is left the, 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 that intention to love, you're not, you're not paying attention to that. Um, it's often because you're engaged in a judgment process. So start to notice what's going on inside. What, what you know, what's your internal monologue? You know, are you <clears throat> evaluating this person that you're with? Uh, are you, are you deciding and, 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 and judging something is bad about them or something is wrong or something stupid or, uh, you know, why, why are they like that? Um, why are they selfish? Um, so you're, you're, you're judging and labeling them in a certain way. And that, and that happens with ourselves. We start judging and labeling ourselves. Uh, and that just becomes this an enormous blockage that gets in the way of self love and love of others. So if you're not, if, if you're, if you're finding it difficult to experience love, check in on your internal monologue. What is going on there? And are you evaluating that person or yourself? in a negative way. Um, and there, there are ways we can teach ourselves to rise above judgment. There's, you know, there's a little meditation. I, I'll just describe it. We don't have to do it, but 
is a very simple meditation. <clears throat> as always, just start with your breath. But then what you do is you pay attention to what's going on inside your body. Just, you know, just noticing, you know, what's, what's happening inside and, no, and noticing if you have a judgment and trying to just observe your internal experience without judgment. You know, when a judgment arises, just notice it, but then just go back to seeing if you can accept and make room for whatever you're observing inside your body. Then bring your attention to your thoughts. What kinds of thoughts are going on? Just, just notice the stream of thoughts. And if, if you have a judgment about a thought, See, or just a judgment thought itself. See, you just notice it, but see if you can go back to just observing your thoughts and letting them be what they are, allowing them to be whatever they, whatever shows up is okay. Uh, make room for it. Then bring your attention to the outside world. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What do you, what do you feel? Or, t you know, the, what are your sense of touch telling you about the outside world? And just noticing all that and seeing if you can allow that experience without judgment. And if a judgment shows up, just notice it, but just go try to go back to just experiencing the world uh, as it is, just making room for what you see and hear and feel. And then to return your attention to your emotions. What's happening inside of me emotionally? And just noticing that, that whatever that emotions, emotional sense is, is, seeing if you can observe it without judgment and, and just allow it to be whatever it is and make room for whatever the feeling is inside. And you could kind of, you can do this as a, as a kind of a, a process uh, repeating through the, the four uh, pieces, the noticing inside, noticing thoughts, noticing outside, noticing emotions. And, and, and we can, we can develop the uh, capacity to observe without judging in that very simple process, observing ourselves and our experience without judging and also observing others without judging. Uh, and, and allowing everybody to be what they are uh, with a sense of acceptance. It sounds a bit like a mindfulness meditation. Yes, it is. It's, a, it's a, a variety of mindfulness meditation. It really is exactly so. We need discernment, not necessarily judgment. Yes, discernment is noticing how something affects you. You know, it, it, it's, it's noticing uh, that, boy, you know, uh, I just ate something and it tastes bitter. I don't like it. It doesn't, it doesn't taste good. It's noticing how that affects me. Um, but judgment is different. Judgment is saying this is good or bad. It, it's, 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 it's casting it in a moral light. And <clears throat> one of the things that Jordan emphasizes over and over again is there is no good or bad, no good or evil. These are cons constructs. These are ideas that we have. And they're very dangerous ideas. Because as soon as we start thinking about things as good or bad and judging them as such, we start taking ourselves away from love. Because love is connection. Love is acceptance. Love is allowing things to be what they are and loving and caring for them as they are. Um, and as soon as we start judging, we start distancing. And judging leads us to tribalism. There's, there's the good people and there's the bad people. And, and that separates and distances us from from others. And it's the antithesis of love. So yes, we can, we can learn to, to live in a world with, with discernment to notice how things affect us and, and, and to, in many cases, avoid things that really f don't feel good, that not morally good or bad, but they just don't feel good. They, they're, they hurt in some way. And we can learn to avoid those things. And that's a perfectly healthy thing to do. Um, but judgment as opposed to discernment is, is pushing things away and, and saying, this is wrong. This is bad. Uh, I, I, this does not deserve to be in my life, uh, that you don't deserve to be in my life because you are bad. That's where we start to get into very dangerous territory. And it's the root of all evil is that, that kind of judgment process. Yes, it can lead us to us and them mentality. Exactly right, which is the essence of tribalism. It's like uh, us is good and them is bad, and I can do anything I want to them, uh, right up to genocide. Um, as soon as I make them them, I dehumanize them. I make them less than, wrong, bad, evil. 
and and I can do anything to them, kill them, enslave them, hurt them in any way, exploit them. So and and that's and that's how uh, we lose love in the world. And it starts with those kinds of judgments, us and them. Self judgment seems to be a hindrance to love as well. It is. Uh, because it's very hard to love others if we have no love whatsoever for ourselves. And if we have, and if we have a lot of self judgment, um, we in fact end up, um, having a, a, a very, should I say, flimsy platform upon which to build love in our lives. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, we recommend in the book is that first of all, that, that little exercise we just talked about of, of seeing yourself without judgment, really practicing ob- observing without judgment, but then also, uh, practicing, uh, you know, a loving kindness or compassion meditation toward the self. And, and one of the reasons we have compa- difficulty having compassion for ourselves is we have difficulty sometimes facing our own pain. We're so busy trying to avoid our pain and push it away and not notice it and suppress it that we, then it's hard to actually be able to be, ha- to have awareness of it so we can have compassion for our suffering. Uh, so, you know, compassion is first of all, noticing that you, like everyone else, uh, things hurt and, and you have pain and you do suffer in different ways. Um, but also having the intention of, of well-being as well. So, you know, a simple, you know, compassion meditation involves, you know, um, you know, may I be peaceful, may I be safe, may I be healthy, uh, happy and, and free of suffering and, and actually wishing that for ourselves, uh, as part of the meditation is a very powerful tool because it acknowledges our pain but also extends the wish that we be free of suffering. So that's the second thing we need to do in terms of building uh, self-love. Uh, and the third thing is, is, is to use the morning intention. Uh, we talked about it a few moments ago in terms of loving others, in terms of the intention at the moment of choice of loving others. But we can also use the morning intention um, to, to care for our body and mind, uh, to see beauty, and, and to act with love today, uh, toward ourselves and toward others. So, so we can extend that morning intention, um, to, to, to loving and caring for ourselves as well as others. Uh, so those are three things that we can do to, uh, strengthen and, and, and build self love. Yeah. It is amazing when we set intentions, how those intentions can ripple out to the universe and back to us and others. The intention to love ourselves, I think, strengthens our ability and, and our intention to love others. Uh, and, and so, you know, love is not a zero sum game. It is infinitely ex- expandable. And, uh, and, and we can form the intention to increase the amount of love in our lives for ourselves and for others. Uh, and, and there's no end to the ways we, uh, the extent to which we can expand love. Uh, and r- virtually every moment of our lives can be about love, uh, as we, as we strengthen it, even that intention. Most, if not all pain seems to be around lack of love. Yeah. A lot of pain is around lack of love, love, but, but a lot of pain is actually about trying to avoid pain. You know, a, a lot of our pain is, is not, is not just, you know, the unavoidable experiences that, that are hard for us, you know, the losses we face and the hurts and, and the physical struggles and so forth. But a lot of our pain is trying to get away from it, is trying to suppress it and push it away. Uh, and it actually makes our, our suffering far worse. Um, so in, 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 in the attempt to avoid things that happen that are that difficult and uh, challenging in life, uh, and avoid emotions that we don't like, um, we actually end up making things so much worse. I mean, you know, I'm a psychologist and one of the th- reasons, one of the things we see as the, as the source of, mo- of, of, of emotional disorders, um, is trying to get rid of the emotion, non-acceptance of the emotion. So that I'm having a painful, I'm feeling sad right now. Or something's kind of scaring me, or I feel a little bit of shame. Um, 
And I don't, so I don't want to have those emotions and I try to push them away. And it turns out that the more you push them away, the more you have them. Um, the, the, that effort to get rid of them is ultimately, um, doomed and actually the, the emotion intensifies. And instead of being just a, a wave, you know, all emotions are waves and they just come and they crest and they gradually recede. I get stuck at the top of the wave because I didn't want to have the emotion. And the more I try not to have it, the more I've got it. And so learning that, that pain is often not so much, you know, the, 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 the natural and difficult things that happen to us in life and the challenges and the, and some, and the, and the, and the, the emotions that hurt, but pain is trying to not have pain. Uh, and so, you know, so some of the work is, is accepting whatever hurts, whatever pain we do have, making room for it, allowing it, because it will come and go. Um, but as soon as we stop, as soon as we say, no, I can't have it, now we've got it. We, we are stuck with it. The other day I was feeling the loss of my mother and I didn't want to cry, but I let myself cry and then I felt better. <laughs> exactly right. I, I work with a lot of people who, who are dealing with grief. And one of the things that's so important is to allow the wave of grief when it shows up. And it, there's, there's no rhyme or reason. Uh, 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 it, you know, things will trigger it and suddenly you have this big wave and, and making room for it, allowing it, that wave of grief to be there. Because what happens if we say, Oh, I can't have that. I don't want to feel that. I'm, I'm going to push that away is now we get stuck with chronic grief where 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 the where the pain is is just sort of almost woven into our the fabric of our existence um because we didn't want to have the wave we have we end up having this chronic sadness or what we also call depression um so grief can turn into depression by not wanting it by pushing it away so always allow the wave uh, ride the wave, let the, let the tears come. But also in the midst of grief, it's important to acknowledge that the love between you and a loved one who's on the other side is still there. And the relationship is still there. And they are still part of your life and they are just a thought away. So, so allow the wave, but also remember that that love continues to exist and that, and that person, that soul can continue to support and guide you. Yeah. I've over the years have engaged in various meditations, like what you've suggested about with your writing exercise and, and getting a connection with your loved one. And I've noticed that the people who have been close to me, who I've lost are exactly that they're a thought away. I think of them, I can ask them a question or notice if they have anything to share with me or, like you say, send them love. And it's a beautiful two-way communication that way. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and you can decide to do that at any time. And remember, we talked a little bit of earlier about uh, love as, as an active process. It, it's, 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 it's something we do rather than something we feel. And, and the love between you and someone on the other side, someone who's passed, can be that same active process. And the active process is opening the channel yeah. and sending your love and listening for what that other soul uh, would like to tell you now. Yeah. And feeling their love that they have in return. You can feel the love from that soul through the channel. And so it's, it's very beautiful. And, uh, and we have to get over this idea that the death is the end of something. Uh, it just changes the means by which we express and, and hear and feel love. How can pain and loss be a pathway to love? I think it starts with just knowing that everything is going to change. You know, on, in the physical world, everything will change. Everything will ultimately be lost, including our own physical lives. And, um, and that knowledge that everything will be changing, everything is impermanent, actually can deepen and enrich love. I mean, I, I get, get an example of my experience with my wife, you know, and we're, you know, there's a lot more time behind us than there is time ahead of us. And, and that, and the awareness of that 
makes makes it more precious the time we have and the love we have becomes more precious because we're very very aware of impermanence we're very aware that everything that we have everything we are at least in the physical world will end and so you know if if we're canoeing on the river uh it's it, we're enjoying a beautiful day together we're having a conversation but somewhere also is the awareness that this is finite and it makes it more beautiful and more precious because it's finite um and it deepens the experience and it deepens the appreciation and gratitude for the for the for this moment of love between us and everyone can can do that it's it's like in the face of impermanence the, the response is gratitude and appreciation that i have this and i'm going to fully engage in this moment and 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 be love in this moment knowing that it is impermanent and it will end therefore we can cherish our lives more in every moment we can cherish our lives in every moment and be grateful for the moments even the moments of pain because we are conscious we're awake we're learning and 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 sir sort of it goes back again to the purpose of life which jordan has a lot to say about the purpose of life is to learn uh that souls come to uh, planets like earth to learn come to a physical environment to learn and one of the main things we're learning is how to love in the face of pain how to how do you love in the face of pain um it's it's easy to love in the afterlife in the spirit world love is everywhere it, there, there's no impediments to it um it's 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 the it's the it's what connects everything but here we have so much friction in a physical world that gets in the way of love i mean just a, a simple example a parent comes home had a bad day at work uh they're tired they're maybe they're kind of sad and a child needs a lot of attention and is really struggling um maybe the child is emotional or sad or struggling with their homework whatever it is and and the, the parent has to somehow find a way to love that child actively and be there for that child in the face of their own pain uh or or two people who you know who are uh, you know uh, in a romantic partnership and one of them says something that feels sort of critical and and hurts the other and 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 that pain makes the other one want to withdraw or get angry or something and 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 so how can I still be loving and, and be love in the face of this pain of feeling hurt or ashamed or a little bit rejected? And so these are, these moments are occurring constantly in our lives. And that question, how can I love in the face of pain is, is showing up over and over and over again. And that's why being in pain is, is one of those moments of choice. Uh, and to be paying attention, you know, boy, I don't feel good right now. What does this, what does this moment ask of me? If I'm going to act on love, what would this moment ask, ask of me? The pain makes me want to withdraw or get angry or get away or, um, or do something to try to avoid the pain. But what would love have me do at this moment? What would love have me do with my child when I'm tired and, uh, and sad? What would love have me do with my partner when I'm hurt and, um, feel ashamed? So that is the question that we have to ask ourselves over and over and over again. What would have love have me do in this moment when, when I'm hurting? Yeah, relationships are just full of that, where there's a dynamic of one person having needs and the other having sometimes a difficult time helping to fulfill those needs. And so then I suppose there's, there's further dialogue that could happen in those relationships to help them in those moments when somebody perhaps is feeling that maybe their needs aren't being attended to. Well, remember, we, we, we talked about these, these, these four pieces of love, you know. So uh, my partner is something, something's going on with them. They don't feel good. And so how, how would I enact love at this moment? Well, 
I could act, enact love by uh, learning more about them, you know, uh, you know, by trying to see them more clearly, you know, asking questions. What, what's going on with you? What, what are you feeling right now? Uh, what, what is hurting you? Uh, and uh, I could also express love by caring. Uh, you know, how, what, what could I do to, to ease your suffering right now? What, what would feel good to you? Uh, how could I support you at this moment? Um, we can enact love through compassion um, by just, you know, wishing that person well, being, you know, saying, I see your pain. I get it. I, I'm, I, I want you to feel better. How, you know, how can I help you feel better? And all of this is enacted in real time with, with actual choices and behavior as opposed to just, you know, well wishing and, um, and, uh, hopes and prayers instead. It's, it's, it's an active process, uh, to, to bring love to that person at the, at that moment. I've been married for a number of years with my husband and I've learned at the end of the day, because we're both working people, uh, when I see him at the end of the day, I typically ask him, you know, how was your day? What went well? What didn't go well? Or what were the challenges? And just doing that simple exercise, uh, really brings us close after not seeing each other for sometimes 10 or 12 hours previously in the day. Yeah. And that's acting on love. And that's w wanting to know and see that person. Uh, a whole day is gone by without, without each other. And there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn about that person in terms of what, th what that day was like for them. So it's a beautiful act of love. It just, it just, you know, inquire, inquiring, you know, how were you? What happened? Tell me about what this day was for you. It's a very beautiful way of enacting love at the end of the day. How can people keep love alive in the face of loss and disappointment in their lives? Loss and disappointment. Uh, can result in, in several things that make love hard. One is withdrawal. Sometimes when we, when we get disappointed, when we experience loss, we kind of withdraw and, and pull, pull away. Um, and then sometimes we judge. And both of those things, uh, really kind of get in the, in the way, you know, disappointment and loss can make us judge and say, Oh, that, that, that was not it. There's something wrong or bad about that. Uh, that it disappointed me. So there's something wrong about it. Um, so withdrawal and judgment really, uh, break the connection of love. Uh, and so I think what's really important is, you know, when we are disappointed, when we have some kind of a loss, can we hold on to an appreciation of the other? in the face of that disappointment love, you know, and so, and so now instead of withdrawing and judging, let me, let me know the other, let me pay attention. Let me, let me understand what's going on for that other person. Um, let me care about what's, what's happening for that other person. Let me act, be active in, in my caring and concern for their well being. Um, and, and let me have compassion for their pain. So, so it, it's, it's a, it's doing the exact opposite of, of withdrawing and judging. It's knowing, caring, and having compassion and, and doing that in an active way with a real intention. So, uh, you know, what do we do when we're, when we're hurt, when we have feelings of loss, when we have feelings of disappointment, we turn toward the person rather than away from them. It is amazing how when we, can bring compassion to ourselves when we might feel hurt by somebody else and, and face our pain rather than run from it. And then we're in turn able to bring that compassion to the other, how it can shift the energy and the dynamic of the relationship and, and give it an opportunity. Of course, some relationships aren't meant to continue and a person has to assess that. But for the relationships that, that do continue, it gives an opportunity for you, like you say, to turn toward that person, bring them compassion, and most people will soften, melt, and really open when they experience that. They do. I mean, let, let me give you kind of a, a mundane example. Your dog poops on the rug, and <clears throat> you know this is very disappointing. 
kind of upsetting. Now there's going to be a lot of work cleaning it up. And, you know, we can have a reaction of judging the dog, the stupid dog, what's wrong with the dog, you know, this, uh, you know, and, uh, or we can just withdraw from the dog. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Throw the dog out the door and, and, uh, and, and, and try to avoid the dog for a while. Or we could have, you know, compassion for the dog. This, maybe the dog's f- feeling sick. Uh, um, maybe, maybe the dog is scared. Maybe I could, maybe I could be aware that this dog has pain and care about that. And, and and have compassion for the dog and that there's something wrong here that not wrong in a bad moral sense but the the the, the dog is hurting in some way um maybe i can give the dog some love in the face of um uh, this the very disappointing thing that the dog did uh and rather than withdrawing from the dog or rejecting the dog or judging the dog maybe i can really uh, try to see the dog what what is the dog's need right now what, uh, and, and, and could I give love in the face of this very disappointing moment where I have to clean up this mess? So, I mean, th- 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 we're talking about a dog now, but the, the, these same processes occur between, between humans. We're constantly being disappointed by each other. Often, often, often we have these moments of disappointment and hurt and, and we, we, it feels like we lose something that's important to us. And, and we can react with with judgment and withdrawal, or we can react with love. Again, it's turning away from or turning toward. Turning away from or turning toward. I love it. Matt, is there anything else you want to share or any messages that come to mind from Jordan around love and impermanence? Jordan sort of says something that I, I really appreciate and I, re- I remember often. He basically says that love is simple. It's caring for and seeing the other. Love is doing in each moment what relationship requires. Love is doing in each moment what relationship requires. And, uh, and I appreciate that because it, it sort of encapsulates for me kind of the essence of what I have to keep remembering about love. Um, love is relationship. It is the connection that binds us to each other. And love is doing what relationship requires. Matt McKay, I've loved talking with you. And I'm so grateful to have these beautiful messages from you and Jordan. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Emmy. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. (music) 